Greetings to you wherever you are, whatever time you're watching this. Oh, just a moment, what's this news? As concerns over the cost of living crisis grow, thousands of protesters join this TUC march in London. With the Bank of England predicting inflation will hit 11% later this year, demonstrators, including teachers, spoke of their anger. Students are hungry on a the morning. They are coming to school. They're tired. They're hungry. They can't concentrate in class. And it's, um, it's becoming ever decreasing in circles. Price of food going up. Um price of fuel going up <laughs> and if you're a young person it makes it hard to even think what's what does the future look like for us how do we feel when we see this is it justified when the energy cap will be changed once again next month do we think of ourselves or of our community the effect that, that people will face physically and mentally the fear of the sheer costs the fear to turning on the appliance, the possibility of crawling under a blanket and in the ensuing isolation. What can we do? And they say the Bible isn't relevant? A passage from Luke 16 verses 19-31 is read to us in parts. There was a rich man who dressed himself in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. So we have a man possibly called Dives, from the Latin about being rich, possibly he was called Nuez, who is dressed in purple. Not just on high days and holidays, but every day. He also wore fine linen. The Greeks suggest that high grade sort of stuff used for <clears throat> underwear. Or what priests wore. Hmm, not something you might want to publicise, would you? And that was capable of feasting with friends on a, a daily occurrence. Life was hard. It's not the first time one of Jesus' tales have started with, now there was a rich man. This is the second instance, this chapter, with one in the previous chapter. The author of the Gospel says in Luke 16 that the Pharisees are lovers of money. Perhaps there's a theme here. At his gate, a poor man named Lazarus was laid full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. But the dogs came and licked his sores. This chap, Lazarus, or El Azar, meaning God helps, Odd that in Jesus' parable rarely are people named. Can you think of one? Lazarus didn't have the strength to get to the gates of the mansion, nor even sit. He might have seen or heard the cavorting from the feast and his whole being crying out for the food, any food. What did he receive? His wounds, his sores were open and were licked by the dogs. Does this remind us of the Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7? She pleads for the food which is thrown for the dogs. Now, dogs weren't generally an accepted animal, bar for guarding or back then, but the saliva of the dog contained peptide antibiotics and they've been found to have a healing effect. So the rich man does nothing, but the dogs allow the wounds to heal quickly. But the man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. So he died without a burial and was seen next to Abraham's bosom. That's a term to being close to God. Recall the disciple that Jesus loved who ate at the Last Supper next to Jesus' bosom. The bosom meant reclining on a U-shaped couch to the right of the host at the meal. We didn't die as a beggar. The word poor in the Greek is the same word used in blessed are you who are poor in spirit. The poor widow who offered two mites wasn't a beggar. Lazarus neither sits nor begs. He's a figure so poor that you can't even identify with him. But is being poor a way to get to heaven? But Jesus hadn't died at that point, so how was this happening? 
Abraham was seen as the one with access to heavenly knowledge for him. It's in 4 Maccabees if you want to look. And it reads, did not die to God, but Abraham lives in God. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. So he is in Hades, not hell. The rich man knows the name of Lazarus, the one who sat outside his gates but wasn't fed. Go on. So he called out, Father Abraham. Who started singing Father Abraham as many sons? Come on, admit it. Seriously though, the rich man addresses Abraham, not Lazarus. He ignores Lazarus as usual. Apologies. Can you go on, please? So he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So he plays the race card. Hey, Father Abraham, I am also one of you, for you are my father. Yes, I know, I feasted daily, ignoring the Sabbath, and didn't help the poor. Yes, I saw the wizened one at my gates and didn't help him, but can you get old Lazarus to pop over as my servant and help poor old me? <laughs> Have mercy upon me. Just what the street beggars said in Luke 18. Help me now! Compassion, null point. Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to there cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Is Lazarus the one in a position of power now. So why doesn't he speak? Did the rich man earn the good life? Did Lazarus earn the bad life? Is living a bad life, being poor, a consequence of our behaviour? A sin, as they might have said? There's a phrase, as Christians, we are to comfort those in discomfort and discomfort the comfortable. Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. In terms of significant numbers in the Bible, the rich man is one of the family of six sons. Six represents evil. The rich man's tone has changed to one of a beggar, but he's still eloquent for one burning up. If you won't help me, help my brothers. So still not help the likes of Lazarus, just help those who are comfortable as I was. Send Lazarus, the one who had to be carried to my gates, to my family. Nothing had changed in the mind of the rich man. The old class structure remains. Should it? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. With the vast majority of the population illiterate, hearing was the only way to receive information. The rich man didn't attend the synagogue. He was feasting, so he wasn't aware of the compassion to the poor part of the Old Testament scriptures. No, Father Abraham, but if someone comes to them from the dead, they will repent. No, you are wrong, Abraham, good buddy, he responds. If someone comes back from the dead, not Jesus as yet, of course, but possibly the rich man, maybe. They do not listen to Moses and the prophets. They will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. If this story predates John 11 and the raising of another chap called Lazarus, then there's no evidence. But we do have the evidence. Lazarus is outside the home, so compassion fatigue may arise. Be wary of those opportunities of compassion right outside our door. Lazarus's silence may be indica indicative of the response conveyed by Paul as an attribute of love, patience. Don't strike back, but remain with God. Hear God's words to us individually and then act. 
I wonder, will the rich man's five brothers love thy neighbour, the stranger? Will we? A prayer of Mother Teresa. Holy God, people are often unreasonable, irrational and self-centred. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. C create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between us and you, Lord. It was never between you and them anyway. Amen. Timothy chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 8. So then, if we have food and clothes, that should be enough for us. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires, which pour them down to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. But you, man of God, avoid all these things. Strive for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. 
run your best in the race of faith and win eternal life for yourself. For it was to this life that God called you when you firmly professed your faith before many witnesses. Before God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who firmly professed his faith before Pontius Pilate, I command you to obey your orders and keep them faithfully until the day when our Lord Jesus Christ will appear. His appearing will be brought about at the right time by God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone is immortal. He lives in the light that no one can approach. No one has ever seen him. No one can ever see him. To him be honour and eternal power. Amen. Command those who are rich in the things of this life not to be proud, but to place their hope not in such an uncertain thing as riches, but in God, who generously gives us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share with others. In this way, they will store up for themselves a treasure which will be a solid foundation for the future, and then they will be able to win the life, which is true life. True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth, or in the Greek, mega wealth. If you have enough food or clothing, let us be content. That's really hard for many. They may have food now, but it's getting a real dilemma in terms of eating and heating. It's not a soundbite, but one which must hit hard. We've had food banks for a decade or so. There are nigh on twice as many food banks in the UK than McDonald's. Other fast food outlets also exist. They aren't something to celebrate, despite politicians often trying to get publicity in one. Next month, the NG price cap is again lifted and it will do again in three months' time, amidst the peak of the cold weather. And people aren't facing the worst of the time already. It's not going to get any easier. The situation in Russia and Ukraine hasn't helped. Possible greed of the CEOs in companies ensuring that all shareholders receive significant bonuses. That profit is seen as a dirty word, must not be seen as a solution, especially when people are facing such hardship. Rather than focusing upon those who have turned the cost of living crisis into one redeemed, the cost of greed crisis, we can look back at the Hebrew scriptures and note from the Exodus 30 the role of the scapegoat. If we can pin the blame onto one third party, not us, we can face another day. Yes, the problem may lie somewhere in, somewhere in somebody else's court, but the solution is to act as God would want us to act. Loving God, where am I in your solution? Here, now. How can we show that compassion at such a time? If we can spare some cash, how do we spend that wisely so that others benefit? If we have some time that we can use for others, what do we do? What is the church you attend doing about their community? This isn't a guilt trip, but a question. Where is our church in God's solution, in God's kingdom? Tell them to use their money to do good, it says. So how might we ponder on this? Take this moment and space now to quietly reflect, not in guilt, but openly and honestly with God. By doing this, they will store up their treasures. They will experience true life. True life that is something the rich man and Lazarus were contemplating, they were seeking. Can we help us all to find that? Take my friend.
We conclude today with prayers brought to us by Mandy and please then join in with the folks as they say together the words of the grace. Holy God, we come to you this week following such heartache for the royal family, to pray for them as they publicly grieved over their mother, grandmother and aunt. May they know of your peace. May we support them as they continue to grieve and we also support those who are grieving over their own losses, some recent, others from possibly during the COVID pandemic. We bring before you those in Pakistan who are still seemingly silent with the lack of media coverage, struggling with the vast floods in their country, the problem of accessing safe drinking water and food we pray for those in the western parts of America, suffering from the typhoon and the abnormal temperatures. This is your world that we are desecrating. Help us to make the necessary changes to allow all to flourish. We pray for our government as they plan to mitigate the significant increases in costs for energy, for homes and businesses. May we hear the cries of those suffering and seek to help. And we lift up those who we know are struggling and need your peace at this time in the silence. Loving God. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore.